Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Amen. Reverend, thank you for having me. Uh, the Sunday meeting was not part of our schedule, but it was uh, the Reverend that decided to extend this invitation. I appreciate the opportunity and I accept the privilege uh, with fear and trembling, trusting the Lord to make grace available to serve his will in Jesus' mighty name. Let us pray. Lord, this morning we ask that you open your counsel to us and grant that your words will be confirmed with signs and wonders to the glory of your great name in Jesus mighty name we'll pray amen you may be seated trying to figure out what the emphasis of the spirit is this morning I drew a very strong reference from the presentation that our is it the art group there was a strong uh, emphasis in the beginning of their presentation concerning the subject of prayer so we will just stay on that on that emphasis for the morning turn your bible quickly with me to the book of matthew chapter 6 matthew chapter 6 i will not be taking too much of your time just to lay out um, the issues and then we'll have an opportunity to exercise ourselves in the place of prayer. Are you there in Matthew chapter 6 beginning from verse number 1? Take heed that ye do not your arms before men to be seen of them Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine arms, do not sound the trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you that they have their reward but when thou doest arms let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth that thy arms may be in secret and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly and when thou prayest thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner corners of the streets that they may be seen of men verily I say unto you they have their reward but when thou prayest enter into thy closet and when thou hast shut the door pray to thy father which is in secret and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly I think that's how much we can take for this morning Hallelujah. In order for us to lay the groundwork of this great enterprise of prayer, it is needful for us to consider critical points and metaphors that are used to depict our God. From New Testament perspective, there are three metaphors that are used to depict God within the context of the prayer enterprise. The first metaphor is George. And you'll find that presentation in the book of Luke chapter 18. In the parable that Jesus gave. In fact, let's just take Luke chapter 18 verse 1 so that you will have an idea of what we're talking about. 
So the first metaphor that was used to depict God on the subject of prayer sees God in the capacity of a judge. And if we are going to deploy prayer at that level, there are rules of engagement when the context is addressing the God who happens to be the custodian of justice, judgment, and equity. In Luke chapter 18, we see a parable that Jesus tells. And he spake a parable to them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So before Jesus began to tell the parable, he summed up the lesson of what he wants to talk about before he even leads us into the content of the parable. Now, this is the lesson. That what? Oh, this my class is, is dry. Let's try again. And if we do not do well, we'll cut this aspect of the syllabus out. When you labor in the wilderness for another two years and you need this knowledge, then the Lord will now make it available to you. Let's look at it again. What is the lesson that Jesus wants us to draw from the parable he's about to present to us. That what? Now listen, listen. This summary or this lesson that Jesus wants us to draw from the parable he's about to present to us <laughs> reveals our design. You know, when you purchase an electronic device, it normally comes with an accompaniment, a, a manual. A manual that gives us insight into how to maximize the potential of the device that you got. If there is anyone that is qualified to give us insight into what God had in mind in the book of Genesis when he said, let us make man, it, it is Jesus. Because Jesus was in that conclave of the Godhead when the policy to make man was sustained. And Jesus is the only one that can reveal to us what exactly God had in mind when he set out to make man. And in seven scriptures, Jesus reveals what was in the original file, administrative file, about man. And this, is, this happens to be one of those times. It, 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 are you still with me? Yes. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. Oh yeah, there's some spirit, there's some spirit here. Now, the Bible reveals that the original design for man is that he is created a creature of prayer. Maybe you have discovered another way to survive that doesn't require prayer. You are malfunctioning. That is not consistent with the prescription of the manual because the God of gods is giving us an insight into what he had in mind before he set out to create man. That man was going to be designed to be a creature of prayer. Men ought, according to design, they ought to function as creatures of prayer and not to faint. In this scripture, he also reveals to us the opposite of being prayerful. And the opposite of being prayerful is not prayerless because there is no time in the entire Bible you'll find the word prayerless in the Bible. According to Jesus, if you are not praying, you are what? You are fainting. And that's the description of the life of the average believer in our generation, fainting people. They are on life support. They need external oxygen to keep their lungs functioning. The objective of this teaching this morning is to occasion a migration and an exodus from the place of fainting to the place of prayer. Please help me preach to your neighbor. It's time to migrate. So Jesus opens up, you see, the subject of prayer was so, difficult, so, so important that he did not leave us to decipher 
the lesson in the parable that he wanted to present to us. He, he took the pains to unveil the lesson even before he gave the parable. Now let's go into the parable briefly, but I'm not going to read everything. I just want to show you the texture of the parable. Can you give me the next verse, please? Saying there was in a city a judge. Stop there. I, I'm not going to go beyond that. You see, in this particular context of prayer, God is seen in the capacity of a judge. You know, I said that uh, there are a few metaphors that are used to depict God, which reveals the many shapes and many dimensions of prayer that is possible and the attendant requirements of engaging God in view of the uniqueness of the metaphors that captures his essence in the first place. So in this place, we see God is presented as a judge. You see, engaging prayer uh, in this context has its own rules, has its own strategies, has its own approaches. And it happens to be that this is not my emphasis, but I'm just showing you that there is a kind of prayer that captures God in the capacity of what? Did you get that? All right. Okay, number two, metaphor. In the book of Luke chapter 11, we see another context. And there is another metaphor that is used to depict God and it is still the subject of prayer that is the emphasis of that delivery in, book, in the book of Luke chapter 11 beginning from verse 5 and I'm not going to read it you, you can read when you get back to your closet in this context God is seen as a friend this is the prayer possibilities that are available to individuals that have taken time to build their intimacy with God there are, there are gateways, there are possibilities that are bound toward you uh, that has decided to build your intimacy with God that is not available to the ordinary believer. This is for intimates. Please help me preach to your neighbor. God has no favorites. God only has intimates. So it doesn't favor one person above another. But there are possibilities that will be unraveled to you when you decide to take the pain to build intimacy with God. And one of those possibilities is in your prayer delivery. This enterprise of prayer is a vast island. And if we are going to master it, we need to be adequately instructed on this subject. Because it seems like the African church prays a lot. It seems so. Seems that there's prayer in Ghana. It seems that there's prayer in Nigeria. In fact, hallelujah. But our nations do not reveal that our prayers are getting to where we are sending it. So we need to sit down on the subject of prayer and investigate it accurately so that we can deploy it according to prescription. In this presentation that I'm bringing to you here, God is seen as a friend and the, the parable captures that context. Are you there? Prayer on this level is different from the normal prayer you pray. This one is predicated on a long established relationship that has been nurtured and cultured over time. And there are possibilities that are trapped in that avenue of prayer. But this is also not my emphasis this morning. I'm just showing you there's something like that. You know, it exists. You may not have experienced it, but it is there. So that you can trust God to um, upgrade your oppression in your adventure for intimacy with God so that you can enter into this dimension. So I'm not going to emphasize it. I'm just showing you that there is prayer at the level of intimacy that is a bit different from the normal prescription of prayer that we hear about. 
you will find, are you with me? For instance, one of uh, the fathers of the faith in my nation, he normally does a monthly prayer for ministers, uh, you know, and it's not something that is advertised on Facebook, it's something he does as a person and younger ministers decided that they wanted to learn the ways of the inner chamber by seeing his model so he decided to admit them into his prayer time on Fridays so um, normally when you come for that prayer they will serve you food first his wife will serve you everybody food if there if there are 50 people 60 no problem she will serve everyone but he himself will not eat then when they finish he will now come and announce that we are going on a journey and we don't know when we'll come back <laughs> and he will say it so politely very politely very carefully you know, as young ministers, what you do is that you begin to pray in tongues and then you pray in tongues for five hours, six hours. When you are becoming weary, you realize that for these five hours and the six hours that you prayed in tongues, he was not praying in tongues. He was just saying, thank you, Jesus, for seven hours. For seven hours. And then those of us that have capacity that can push it to 15 hours, when you now take a break and you listen to him, he's still saying, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. He will now start praying two, two hours to the end of the prayer meeting. That means 5 a.m. is when he will start his own prayer. All he did for all the night was saying what? Now, that kind of application is not in the textbook. That type is not prescribed. You will not see Moses giving us such an example. Those are dimensions of adventure in prayer that can only be revealed through a long track record of intimacy and when that man is true with saying thank you Jesus ah, you will notice that the collectibles I mean the things that are available for you to collect in prayer when he begins to download what he collected and the reason why he was saying thank you Jesus was that he was he, his conduit was collecting items so when he takes delivery of one item he will say mm, thank you Jesus It became clear to us that there was a dimension in prayer that we did not know. I personally have capacity to pray in tongues for 18 hours. And I, yeah, I, I can do that. I can do that. In this hall, I can be pacing for 18 hours, almost 24 hours. I, I've not done 24 before, but I think there's grace to do that. But I've done 18. Then I found out that there was something about prayer that was established on friendship. And that prayer meeting became a lesson that helped my, my life. So I, I know that thing now, that thing the man was doing. I know it now. Um, let me stop there, let me stop there. Okay, let's go to my place of emphasis uh, and that's the Matthew chapter 6 that I read and in the context of Matthew 6, God is seen as a father. That's the metaphor that captures God. He's seen as a father. And the rules of engagement in prayer uh, consistent with that metaphor it is different. Now, it is that context of prayer I want to bring to our notice.
Turn your Bible with me. To Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. He shows us the first obstacle to engaging the Father. And the first obstacle is functioning as a hypocrite. If we were to do a good analysis of the book of Matthew chapter 6, you will see that there is a giving hypocrite, there is a prayer hypocrite, and there is a fasting hypocrite. If we wanted to do an analysis of Matthew chapter 6 uh, adequately. But you see, I'm not so concerned about the other aspects of this application, but it is possible for you to be a prayer hypocrite, and that's the first thing that Jesus reveals if you want to engage God as Father, you must fight against the possibility of being a prayer hypocrite. And I'm going to show you why. Because some guys are actually in the business of prayer, but their delivery of prayer is in the category of the hypocrite. And because it is in the category of the hypocrite, they do not qualify for any response whatsoever. There's not going to be any feedback for their efforts. So that's the first thing that Jesus reveals. He said, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. So you see, the audience of the hypocrite is men. But the audience of the one engaging the Father is God. And Jesus is saying, beware of putting up a prayer display that is designed to inform men that you have capacity to exercise yourself spiritually. Before he goes into the details of how to engage, he strikes at the possibility of hypocrisy in this delivery. He says, do not be as the hypocrites are. The hypocrites want to be seen of men. And because of that, they are disqualified from their reward. Now stay with me, stay with me. Are you with me? Okay. You will notice that when someone begins to engage in the enterprise of prayer, the reason why he's doing it is because he wants answers to prayer. He wants a feedback from God. <laughs> the idea here is a bit different from answers. What God has in mind to give to you for which he's inviting you to come into the prayer floor is a little bit higher than answers. God wants to give you rewards for prayer. Meanwhile, you are looking for answers to prayer. All right, I, I notice you are confused. I'm just following the script, okay? He said, verily, he said the hypocrite plays, manipulates himself outside of the possibility of getting a reward for his efforts. Are you there? So what God wants you to obtain for which he gives you the invitation to come into his presence are prayer rewards. And I don't have time this morning to show you a few prayer rewards. And the reason why you qualify for prayer rewards God wants to reward you for prayer. But you want answers to prayer. So what we'll do is that we'll just limit the syllables to answers, the answer level. Because you desperately need answers uh, and, uh, so that you can know how to get them. But God's intention is to bring you to the economy of rewards. Now, go on, go on. Next verse. Next verse. But thou, when thou prayest, he said, enter into thy closet. 
I went down, I shut the door. Hi. So there are too many metaphors here. He says, enter into thy closet. And if you notice, the closet there is idiosyncratic. The closet there is personal. The closet there is your closet, not our closet. It means that in prayer, you must be able to find your closet. And the closet he's talking about here doesn't mean the privacy of your dormitory. It doesn't mean a, a, a place, one of the forests on your campus, then you isolate yourself and go there and say, right now I'm in the closet. If you have not found your closet, it is called the prayer place. There is a place in the spirit from whence prayer is made. You must find that place and just, oh my, you're not with me. You're not. You're not there. Meanwhile, this is not my message. I'm just taking you on a ride. I've not arrived. But since you are not so interested in this ride, obviously. Now, there is what we call a prayer point and there is what we call a point of prayer stay with me are you there now the point of prayer is what we call the prayer place there is a place that you must arrive at in the spirit before you can begin to prosecute prayer and and, 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 and that prayer place is different for individuals so you must find your own place that's what we call the point of prayer it is when you arrive at the point of prayer that you can begin to offer your prayer point some people are offering prayer points when they have not arrived where the point of prayer You must have realized that uh, prayer is not something you can accomplish with human energy, with fleshly energy, with the energy of the fallen man. And we know this from the book of Psalms 80 verse 18 that says, so we will not depart from thee, quicken us. Give me Psalms 80, not 18 verse 18, but 80, 80 verse 1, 8. He says, so we will not go back from thee. We will tarry in your presence until you quicken us. We cannot call upon your name. <laughs> I know most of us understand prayer in the energy of the flesh. You, are, you have not arrived your point of prayer. Your point of prayer is that point where the Holy Spirit quickens you. When he quickens you, he gives you vocabulary. When he quickens you, he's the one that will be responsible for your prayer points. That inbuilt administration that is designed to support prayer takes full effect. The moment you arrive at the point of prayer, he said, when thou prayest, shut the door. Oh my. It's a journey into God. And if you really get into that point of prayer, even if somebody is singing reggae outside, it will not catch your attention. You'll be sucked into the spirit. And the intercourse of prayer will begin to take place. Are you with me? All right. So it says, when thou prayers, he said, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, When you arrive at the point of prayer, what the consciousness of what drives you is a consciousness of the environment of the before of God. And it doesn't matter what happens in your space. You are sucked into that realm and you can engage. The, the atmosphere is designed to be so personalized that you can engage your father. There's a warmth of relationship a want of love that is captured in that atmosphere that makes it an enterprise that was designed just for you. 
But you will never see the beauties of prayer in this regard if you have not been able to find a point of prayer when you begin to release your prayer points. I know we are used to coming in with a catalog of prayer points. And I need my white hair to become black. So there are all kinds of prayer points. But the, the challenge, there's nothing wrong with your prayer points, but you need to find the point of prayer. So, we will not depart from you. It means when that guy started prayer engagement, it was so, so dry and he was discouraged. But he determined that he will not depart because he's trying to arrive at what? The point of prayer. We will not depart from thee, quicken us. And we shall call upon thy name. You see, it's when you are quickened that, that you begin the calling. Because it, it survives on the energy that God makes available. The, yeah, you, you desire to pray. Yeah. But prayer survives on God's energy. Meanwhile, you might do some things in the flesh, some effort, some make some attempts in the flesh. All right? And you satisfy yourself that you are praying, but you never arrive at the point of prayer. And most people end their prayer sessions without arriving at the point of prayer. And if that's your case, if that's the description of your life, you will never see the power of prayer. Because it's not consistent with the prescription. According to the prescription, you need to find the point. It takes doggedness. It takes consistency. It takes going beyond how you feel. Sometimes you feel dry. Sometimes it's like a waste of time. And those feelings are the feelings of haste that Satan brings into your soul in order for you to perceive the adventure to be so, so, so terrible. And then you disembark before you arrive at the point of prayer. A man that is going to know prayer must understand the principle of endurance. To endure the storm that Satan creates in your soul. To distract you from the goal which is intimacy with God, which is encounter with God. You will need to stay put even though you are the turbulence. Satan creates a pseudo turbulence to make you feel that the adventure is of no effect. The adventure is a scam. And he has discouraged a lot of people outside of riches of, of intimacy with God because he starves you in your soul and creates an, a false alarm that makes you disembark from the adventure. Jesus said your prayer begins when you shut the door. There is a location that you must find. In that location God comes to give you his own energy and to quicken you so that you can call upon his name. It, 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 it's a sweet experience if you ever get to that place that is your point of prayer because the energy that drives the whole adventure is not from earth but from heaven. God sucks you into himself and he gives you the vocabulary with which to communicate to him. And, oh my God, it's, it's a, oh Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. You see, I, I was there before I came down here and it is so difficult stepping down out of that atmosphere to come talk to people. So difficult. I can be there till evening tides. That's my real life. The life of a nocturna in the secret. Because when you find that place, space, time, poverty, lack, does not is not there oh my then then god creates the atmosphere that makes you feel that he left the whole world just to attend to you that's the kind of encounter that helps your perception of self esteem all the um, motivational exposures that you have had to help improve your self-esteem is in futility. It is your encounter with the God of heaven as he zeroes in upon you and makes grace to abound toward you that becomes the source of your security because you have found security in him that everything can fail 
but the man you see in that place of prayer that point of prayer he will never die so heaven and earth can pass away Satan can stir up your environment make you feel that you are a failure but there's a place where you do not fail that place you meet with your father he doesn't he, he takes you beyond failure and in order for you to succeed, I would like you to know you will need to win in your soul before you win on the ground. And that's the place where our souls are restored. The psalmist had a little experience of this matter that I'm talking about when he said that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. For he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul there were many times where there were there was there was confusion in in my family and i went to that point of prayer and my soul drank into the tranquility that was resident in heaven and when i came out of the chamber the problems around did not change but my soul flourished with the wonder of the one that I had encountered. Sometimes God doesn't change the situation. He changes you. And when he changes you, then you have the capacity to go through the situation. For want of time, I need to shut down. First thing that we need to know, when engaging God as father because someone here is tempted to say that you know I'm a father too I'm a father of three I'm a father of five and because I'm a father I think I understand I have an idea of how God the father is I came to disappoint you you lie your model of fatherhood is by no means approximated to the type of father that God is. And I need to show you from the scriptures because you will not believe me. So I want to take you to the book of Matthew chapter 7, quickly. Matthew chapter 7. Uh, I think verse 11. Matthew 7 verse number 11. Now this is a contrast. Matthew 7, 11 is a contrast and a comparison. Once and again, well, you know, Jesus is an object teacher. In order to upgrade our understanding of things, Many times he does comparison so that we can put things in proper context. And that's the kind of thing that Jesus is doing here in the book of Matthew chapter 11. And he says, if then, if ye then being evil, sorry, see, is Jesus speaking, not me. Hallelujah. Who am I to be able to say this? But you know, that's why, even though you have a good pastor, you still need to hear Jesus. Because Jesus will tell you things that human beings might be afraid to tell you. Jesus said, if ye then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. And what Jesus means by this is, in comparison to God, your model of fatherhood is evil. Even though you are a good man that knows how to give good gifts to your children. And, and I apologize to fathers for that. All fathers, I apologize to you. But this is Jesus in his comparative theology. He said, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more? Now you, you, you are evil. In comparison to God the Father, your model is evil. Your model is evil. But yet, you do good things to your children. No one of them will come and ask you for fish and you give him snake. No one of them will come and ask you for bread and you give him a stone. But inherently, compared to me, you are evil. And you yet give good gifts unto your children. He now says, How much more? That is in a greater context, in an incomparable context, will your father give good things to them? That what? So your model of fatherhood, as good as it is, because your children would say you're a good man. I like to think of myself as a good man. I, I'm, oh my God. 
My son comes to me and says, you are the best father on earth. Yeah, I've got that many times, you know. So in my own, I believe that I'm a good man. I believe so. But the Bible says, if ye be evil compared to God, your model as bright as it is, is equated to evil. And he says, in a greater dimension beyond your comprehension, this our heavenly Father is able to give, desires to give good things to them that will be stupid enough to engage in prayer. Them that will be stupid enough to ask him. So it means that, are you there with me? Are you there now? So prayer becomes a bait by which we can explore such goodness that is in God that we cannot find in our earthly parents. I know your earthly, your earthly parents were wonderful people and all of that. There, there, there is goodness in God that is way beyond the dimension that you have felt around your earthly parents. God wants to give you direct access to the texture of his parentage and this parentage is in many dimensions in many aeons different from the good you had in your family and through prayer we can access it so I just brought this scripture just to educate any father that is in this room that said well you know I have an idea of how the father is because I'm a father oh, sorry your model in this chart is called evil and uh, hallelujah so each and every one of us will need to explore the dimensions of God's good which is not inherent in our model of fatherhood and we can explore that if we decide to begin to ask is that clear all right let me take you further there is only one way to know the father one way and that's in the book of Matthew chapter 11 verse 27. When I finish this, then I'll show you one attribute of our father. Then I'll, I'll, I'll step down. Hey. I think I'm out of time. Oh yeah? Reverend, I'm, I'm out of time? Okay, okay, okay. Almost? Alright, so I'll just round up. Now this is Matthew chapter 11 verse 27. He said, all things are delivered unto me of my father and no man knoweth the son but the father. And neither knoweth any man the father save the son and he to whomsoever the son reveal him. So you do not know the father. The only person that knows the father intimately is the son. And the only people that will know the father are the people, such people that the son has revealed the father to. Are you get, are you, do you understand that? So if we want to study this person called our Heavenly Father, who happens to be the object of our prayer emphasis at this level. Are you there? We will need to study the scriptures to find what Jesus says about his Father because Jesus is the only one that has the capacity to be the revelator of his Father. Only Jesus can reveal. So I need to show you. I, have, I found nine things that Jesus said about the Father, but I'll show you one. Then I'll sit down. Go back to um, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, 6. Say one thing, then I sit down. These were the things I had to troubleshoot my prayer life because I was, I believed I was praying a lot and I was seeing little or no results for a long time. So I had to trouble, troubleshoot my prayer life. I had to go study the Bible to find out what am I doing wrong? And I found so many things wrong. And when I adjusted and I began to pray in the light of the knowledge I found, I got too many results until I, oh my, you know, oh my God. Okay, you don't understand that. Too many. I was brought into an island. An island of possibilities. I don't know how much time I have left. I wanted to work with. Reverend, just tell me if I have two minutes, one minute. Because I want to pray. I want to test this prayer. You know I'm teaching about prayer. 
prayer is not theoretical. Prayer is practical. I want to test it if it will work here. We'll pray about something now and see if it will happen. That's a proof that it works. So I want to have a moment, two minutes, three minutes, for us to look for an impossible thing and pray about now and see if it will not happen. I'm a scientist. I was trained in the lab. We don't believe what you cannot prove. Yeah. And I was good in, in, as, as, as a scientist. And I've not found the scriptures contradictory to the science that I studied. Evidence is part of what God has to offer you. Amen. All right. So the Bible says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. You see, are you there? Oh, you are not there. Now, according to this presentation, our father has a location. And his location is that he is in secret. That's what makes a hypocrite. The hypocrite does not know that the father is in secret. So he's doing public presentations. Meanwhile, the person that he's supposed to be engaging is not where he is. And that makes his engagement a, 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 an activity of futility because he doesn't understand that our father is where? That's not all. And thy father which see it in secret. He's not just in secret. He also does what? He sees in secret. But when he wants to reward, how does he do it? So our father is in secret. Our father sees in secret. But our father rewards how? Open. It means that when our father... Are you still there? Are you there? I'm still talking about prayer rewards here. I know you are concerned about answers. I will show you how to get answers. Don't worry about that. But our father who is in secret, he sees in secret, then he rewards open. It means that the culture of prayer takes you into the cocoon. It's just like the intimacy between a husband and a wife. And then suddenly you begin to see the wife's tummy protrude. You pray about it, it's still growing. You bind it, then it grows more. There is something that took place in secret that you can no longer hide in your pocket. They, they, they have many brilliant, um, what do they call those garments? Maternity garments. They are brilliant types with so many designs trying to conceal the reality. But as brilliant as the garments are, they fail to conceal the effect of that which was crystallized in secret. Can we go further? I'll just run. I'll just round up. Let me just round up then. Okay. No more Bible. You see, I like the Bible so much. If it's still open, I will still read it. So let me stop now. Hallelujah. Now, this scripture is inviting us to, to understand something that. Are you there? Our God sees in secret. Do you still remember when God was trying to disciple Samuel and God told Samuel that men look on the outward appearance, but I look on what? The heart. See, what is going on in the heart is what is concerned, what God is concerned about because he's in secret. He's concerned about the altar of your heart. That's where prayer, the prayer fires are kindled. So it's the activity of your heart in the administration of prayer. That is God's emphasis. Because it is possible for someone's mouth to be saying something and his heart is saying something else. God is going to pick your prayer from your heart and not your mouth. And that's why the hypocrite does not know this. He puts so much on his mouth when his heart is not in alignment. He has missed his reward. So if you are going to be someone that will prosper from prayer, you must be someone that knows how to texture your heart to God. Then, are you there? If this enterprise therefore places a demand on the state of your heart, you will know that you cannot have a heart 
that is sinful and you want to engage him that sees in secret because the moment you are coming he sees you understand you cannot have bitterness and malice in your heart and then you want to come engage the one that sees the heart you, you will look futile you will look you will look do you understand that many of us care about your mind that's why you came to Cape Coast University many of us care about our looks that's why you came with your makeup and your foundation but the average believer doesn't care about the heart and he wants to engage the God that sees in secret the first thing that God will do to you when he wants to take you deeper into the realms is that he will, he will give you a consciousness of your heart 24 hours of the day maybe I do something that will hurt that sister my heart will begin to trouble me because if I'm going to take that, that same heart to God I, I'm not going to access him so I go back to that sister and say so and I get her to make a commitment that she has released me the reason is because of my heart that's what I'm going to use to navigate that's where the altar is that's where the sacrifice will be put on that's where the incense and the fragrance will rise from into the sanctuary of God as long as my heart is in connection I can bring heaven down and I can bring heaven down now yeah it's, it's a game of the heart because our God is a God that is in secret our God is a God that what? See it in secret. And our God is a God that rewards how. Now you got that one point. So let me do practical for two minutes. So that to justify my teaching. That what I'm teaching is not theory. It's not a lecture in the classroom. Are you there? Now you don't need to believe what I want to do. But it's going to happen. Everyone in this hall and everyone outside that has an eye defect that occasions you to use glasses, either short-sightedness, long-sightedness, stand up on your feet. I didn't say pray, I just say stand up. No, Reverend, you sit down, you sit down, please. I'll, I'll, I'll come to you. Now stay with me. Is it so noisy to stand up? But I'm hearing. Just stand up. Take if you have your glasses on, take remove them. Put them in a secure place. You know, some of the glasses look so fine. It seems most of you don't want to part with them. It's, it's, see the frame. The frame is just Gucci, Gucci frame. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm a, I'm, I'm a clown, don't worry. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, so what we are talking about here is that as long as my heart is in tune and the Holy Ghost doesn't register upon my heart any sense of displeasure whatsoever, I am capable of downloading the best of heaven. I'm capable of that. A, a prayer man that wants to benefit from prayer takes care of his heart. That's why I will, not, I will not backbite you because it will stay in my heart. It will reduce my chances before the presence of God. That's why sometimes people find me, I keep mute. You know why? I have a heart to protect. They, 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 they don't know when, oh, they can violate the heart because they don't have anything with God. Me, I have so much with, I will, I'll go down the drain the moment I cannot hook up with the heavens. So I will not fight back. You will always know the man that prays. He guards his heart with all diligence because he knows out of it are the issues of life. All right, so let's let's start saying. I will pray a simple prayer, and people will be healed. I cannot tell the number of people that will be healed, but people will be healed. Let us pray. Do this for me quickly. Just lay your hands on that eye. Those those eyes. Lay your hands on those eyes. 
we want to walk in the ways of Jesus. Hey, who told you to increase that volume? Hey, you're right. Oh my God. Show us the ancient paths. <laughs> Lead us along eternal highway. We want to walk in the ways of Jesus. We want to enter your way. Show us the ancient path. Lead us along eternal highway. We want to follow the footsteps of Jesus. We want to enter your way. Show us the ancient path. Lead us along the eternal highway. We want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. We want to enter your way. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for this combined service here in Cape Coast. I want to ask of you this request concerning the eyes of my brothers, the eyes of my sisters, concerning the eyes of those that are standing outside under the cap canopies in the overflow. I ask, O oh God, in your name, as I bind every blinding spirit. Blinding spirits be bound in the name of Jesus Christ. I destroy your stranglehold in the name of Jesus Christ. I destroy your power in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out of the eyes in Jesus' mighty name. in the name of Jesus now I say unto you I see in Jesus name remove your hand from your eyes remove your hand from your eyes Con conduct a test on your eyes now you have one minute to conduct a test if you need to read something to verify. Those that have experienced a marked change in the delivery of your eyes after your test, you will indicate. So you have one minute to run the test and if you notice that there is a change on your eyes, you indicate by a wave of hand so that the preacher will know. So you have one minute conduct your test, your independent test, begin to conduct it now and the moment you find that there is a change, just wave your hands to the preacher so that the preacher can know that you can see alright so we have one sister there, we have one brother there, we have another sister we have another brother, we have someone at the back we have someone here, we have one oh my god alright, alright those of you whose hands are lifted up, can you come to me quickly, quickly, quickly here, quickly here. 
Now, I know, doctor, I know you're surprised, you know, this is not how you treat people. Uh, an ophthalmologist is supposed to conduct uh, an investigation, maybe prescribe glasses. Jesus heals eyes. He doesn't do prescription. He heals eyes. I know you're surprised. <laughs> Please help me tell your neighbor there is nothing wrong with the name of Jesus. Now, see, see how many people are already here. And let's confirm that. You know, some people think I, I went to the market, to the campus, to meet them in the night, to ask them to come testify. So that's what they think. So please, you need to deliver me. Did we talk in the night? Did we meet in the night so that you come and give a testimony that you're... This is the first time you ever spoke. Okay, this is the first time we're just seeing. I don't even know his name. And maybe he doesn't know mine. <laughs> so what happened to you? My brother. For years now, I've, been ne I've never been able to see bright lights. The blind. Okay, you are photophobic. Yes, and letters that are so close become very blurry. And letters that are far away become blurry. You have to be at a specific distance before you to see. see. Okay. But after I removed my hands from my eyes and opened my eyes, my I was able to see that light properly. Yeah. And it doesn't hurt me anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hear her. Short sight. You are what? I am short sighted. Okay, you are short sighted. And most of the times I have blurred visions. Blur but visions. after praying, I see things clearer now. So she, she can see clear. So, doctor, you're seeing. And I didn't touch them because it's not about me, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. Okay, yes. So when we came this morning, I was telling my pastor friend that I left my glasses. You, you left your glasses? Yes. Yeah, God manipulated her to leave her glasses at home. And the place felt very blurry, but okay. then when he said we should place our hand on our eyes, I did. I could feel some shakes. When yes, some things, I some reactions were taking place. Like so when, I when you administer <laughs> eye drops, you know, that's the Jesus eye drop. Chloramphenicol, chloramphenicol eye drop. <laughs> Yeah, so you felt something on your eyes. Yes, so when I opened it, you said you should do a small test. Do a test, and yes. I was able to see much brighter she, than before. She can see much brighter. Yes. My situation is kind of similar to my brother over here. Okay. I also couldn't see from afar. So when I placed my hand on my eyes, I felt something piercing this particular eye. Yeah. And when I took it off, I also couldn't see from afar, but now I see. You can eye. see. Now, there's someone among us, your, the eye, your eye condition has been so for 12 years, and the Lord healed you. I, I, I want to see that person. For 12 years. You have had an eye condition for 12 years. For 12 years. That's what the Holy Spirit tells me. For 12 years. For 12 years. Yes? Find out from her what's, what's going on. She's had a condition for 12 years. The Holy Spirit is telling me that. And he, he has taken it away. Now. Amen. Yeah. She went to the hospital. Went to and, a hospital. Yes. And apparently they asked if she has any blinding condition in her family. Okay, so they, they tested asked her. if there was a situation of blindness, of blindness in, the family. in her family. Yes. They did a test on her, confirmed this glaucoma, and glaucoma. said there was no cure for her. Okay, no cure. Yes, but after the prayer, things have improved. Okay, now, now listen. There are three of you I'm looking for, right? Three of you. I don't know whether they're here or they're here, but the Lord will show me those three people. And he will do that by putting his hand upon them, right? These three people will... will after a few years, you, you'll be able to do what I'm doing. Bring healing to people. Three of you. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, okay. There are some of, they can even be in the congregation. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask, Lord, those individuals that you want to give the gift of healing, let your, let your hand begin to descend upon them. Descend upon them. Yes. 
descend upon you. Now, are you with me in the practicals? Now, that was a simple prayer and there was... It's, it's a thing of the heart, okay? So if I touch you, you can go. If I touch you, you can go, okay? Miracle is permanent in the name of Jesus Christ. It's permanent. It's permanent. Permanent in the name of God.